thank you, Professor, for having me. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It's such a, a real honor uh, to be in Japan and uh, to be in Waseda uh, University and to talk to you today about something I am very passionate about and I think is uh, important uh, for everyone that we know because we all use money all day, every day. Uh, and money is changing. So I'm excited to be here and to share with you uh, how we think it's changing and, and hear what you think as well. Um, before we start, a couple quick questions for you. Um, is this pace of my speaking, it's okay? Yes. You can understand more or less. Great. Um, if you have trouble understanding me when I'm speaking, please raise your hand. And I will know I'll slow down uh, or repeat. Um, and if you have a burning question in the middle, please raise your hand. And we'll talk about it. We can have an interactive uh, presentation. And when I'm finished, uh, I would love to hear your questions. Uh, and we do have cool t-shirts <laughs> made by our very uh, cool Japanese uh, community leaders and members. Um, so thank you again for having me, it's a big honor for me. Um, I think we'll, yeah, turn the lights, thanks. So, uh, the future of money and user-generated currencies. The term user-generated comes from the internet. On the internet, we know uh, user-generated content, right? Like blocks made by users and uh, user-generated video, like YouTube, videos made by users, uh, forums, Wikipedia. The internet allows users, like you and me and everyone we know, to generate uh, content for other people on the network. And now, in the world of blockchain, it allows users, like you and me, to generate currency, tokens, money, for people in the network. So that's uh, what we'll talk about today. I'd like to start with this picture of me from uh, Palo Alto, California. I grew up where Facebook grew up. I grew up where Google grew up, and Amazon, and Twitter, uh, all of the internet uh, products uh, come from Palo Alto, and I come from Palo Alto also. It's uh, in California, close to San Francisco. So any useful statement about the future should at first seem ridiculous. Why? Because the future is not here yet. When we talk about something that's not here yet, it should seem very strange. If it seemed obvious, it would be here already. So it's a nice context uh, for blockchain and the future of money because some of what we say in cryptocurrency uh, seems ridiculous. Anyone can make money, there's infinite money, we don't even need money. It sounds ridiculous. But it may be a useful statement about the future. Has anyone read this book, Sapiens, by Dr. Uh, Yuval Noah Harari, an Israeli uh, social scientist, researcher? This book, it's great. You, uh, if you care to read it, I'll tell you one thing about this book that I think is important for today. In this book, he describes why humans are different than animals. Because in many ways, we're the same. We have almost the same genome as monkeys. Almost exactly the same. We do a lot of the same things as monkeys. 
our children, we comb their hair, we feed each other, we play games, uh, we work together, we build our houses. But there's a very critical difference between uh, monkeys and that, all the animals and humans. And the doctor says the difference, anyone have a guess? What's, what's so special about humans? Yes? We use tools. That, say it again? We use tools. We use tools. So yes, we use tools. Monkeys also use tools. They use rocks and, and use tools. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good, good guess. What's yours? Language. Language. Good one. Good one. So what the doctor says, and it's very similar to what you suggest, and I think we have our first t-shirt <laughs> already, um, is that humans tell stories. Of course, we use language to tell stories. But we tell stories in order to organize our uh, belief system, how we think the world should be, how we think society should function. So examples of stories that humans tell ourselves and each other uh, are religion. We have the story of Jesus, we have the story of Buddha, we have the story of uh, other uh, religious beliefs, religious uh, ideas, and these uh, stories whether they're true or not, no, no judgment. The stories help us organize our society. We go to church, we uh, respect each other, whatever are the, the stories in our religions. And the reason I start with this is because money is a story. Money is a story that we tell ourselves that we tell our children, that we tell through the generations, and it produces the organization of society. The current story of money, and, and we'll talk about the history, but to give you an example of what, what is a story of money, we need money. We can't survive without money. We should have more money. That's a good thing. These are stories that we share. So if we look at the history of this story about money, what is money really? What is it? Anyone have a, want to share their story of what money is? You're gonna hear mine anyway. So we talk about money as a tool, to your point. I probably should also get a t-shirt uh, for tools. So money is a tool. Like you use a rock to shape a, a weapon, you use money to work with other humans, other people. You give them money, they give you something. It's a tool to help us collaborate. If you were a species of one, one human, you would not need any money. You would just live as best you can and eat as best you can and uh, enjoy as best you can. You, don't, you wouldn't need to collaborate with another human, so you would not need money. But because we are not one, ever, we are many, to work together we use the tool called money. Money is our shared accounting system. What's the story here? The story is that we believe that when we work together, when we collaborate, we should kind of be in balance. If I uh, give a lot to other people, I should also get a lot from the society. If I don't give anyone anything, if I only take from people, I should not enjoy 
getting from others anymore. That's the story that we believe about cooperation, that we should be more or less in balance with each other. In order to count if we're in balance, if I gave more or if I took more, we use this tool called money. It's supposed to be the shared accounting system to tell us who gave how much to society, gave products, gave services, gave ideas, gave time. There's many ways, of course, we can give to society, give to others. And the money is supposed to count how much did we give, and now that money tells us how much we can get from the society. So the history of money. In the beginning, money, the tool that we use for money, for this shared accounting system, uh, came from the earth. Things we could see and touch and count. Things like gold and silver, uh, salt, oil, um, seashells, sticks, anything that came from the earth, we could count it and we could use it uh, like money. It could be anything. And often it was uh, gold because gold uh, and other metals were uh, rare. So when you had them, you knew you were part of this shared accounting system. Money 2.0, and this is the generation we are still in today, 2.0. Money comes from the government. Money comes from the people that are in charge in every country. In America, they make dollars. In Japan, you make yen. In Europe, they make euro. In this era of money, before governments, even as we know them today, kings and queens made the money. They stamped the coins. The, the people in charge had the responsibility and the privilege of making the money, making the shared accounting system. Of course, when you make the money, you often are close to the money. You also maybe get benefits from making the money, but it's not necessary. The, the story here is that we need someone in charge so that it's organized and trustworthy, and they make the money that we use as the tool in society to collaborate. We need to work together. I'm not a farmer. I don't grow food. You grow food, but you uh, don't teach children. So I take food from you, I give your children uh, lessons, and we use money to move our skills <coughs> and talents and time throughout society, like a current of energy that moves through the people. So this is uh, money 2.0. How many here have heard of uh, blockchain? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Some. And uh, what about uh, Bitcoin? Also some people. Great. So in money 3.0, which is the beginning of where we find ourselves today and what I would love to share with you. In this era, money can come from the people. Who are the people? Satoshi Nakamoto, who made Bitcoin, he or she. Um, the people who made Ethereum, another popular cryptocurrency. Uh, the people who made Bancor, my team and myself, and thousands and thousands and thousands of other people who are making uh, cryptocurrencies using blockchain. I haven't said yet if this is good or this is bad. 
But this is different. This is very different. We have not <coughs> seen yet a time in history where people, any person, could suggest to other people uh, what is money. Let's use this. So it's a very uh, interesting new time with a lot of different dynamics. Some maybe are wonderful and some maybe are challenging, but certainly it's a very different time. This is just a few examples of cryptocurrencies uh, that exist today. Um, some of them you may recognize. Uh, Omise Go is a Japanese uh, created currency. Um, the people who create uh, these currencies are truly from uh, all over the world. And they are uh, entrepreneurs, uh, technologists, designers. Um, today there are, let's say, a few thousand kinds of cryptocurrency. And in the future, we expect for there to be hundreds of millions of cryptocurrencies. Just like we know today that we have hundreds of millions of YouTube videos. We have hundreds of millions of blogs. We have hundreds of millions of forums and Facebook groups and chat groups and user-generated uh, articles like Wikipedia. On the internet, there are hundreds of millions of pieces of content whenever people are able to approach the tools and use the technology. So, why is money valuable? What makes money valuable? What makes this tool so useful? What's the, the superpower of money? Like, the superpower of a rock as a tool is that it's hard. You can break things with it. The superpower of a gun, let's say, is that it can shoot things uh, very fast. Um, the superpower of money, of the tool called money, is that it's liquid. What does liquid mean? That it can change. It can flow like water, that's where the word comes from. It can change into whatever you want it to be. If you want it to be food, you buy food. If you want it to be a house, you buy a house. If you want it to be a vacation, you buy a vacation. The money itself, the tool called money, is not very useful. You can't eat the money. You can't build a house with the money. You can't uh, take a vacation with the money. The money can turn into the thing that you want. The money unlocks the thing that you want from another person. And of course, as the system becomes more complex, it's not one to one, it's many to many. The money becomes an iPhone. It's not one person made the iPhone. 10,000 people together in factories and companies all together made the iPhone. But my money can unlock the iPhone for me. So that is what liquidity means. In financial terms, the more liquid a money is, the more easily it can change into the thing that you want. So for example, the US dollar is the most liquid money for now. It's the one that can change into anything at any time. You can be stranded in uh, the desert of Zimbabwe. But if you give someone a US dollar to 
to unlock their health or their time, most likely they'll say, okay, they'll, they'll accept the US dollar. With the yen, maybe, maybe similar. With uh, the Zimbabwe dollar, not so much. <laughs> if you're in America and you say, here's a Zimbabwe dollar, can I buy that pizza? They'll look at it. No. <laughs> the money will not turn into the pizza. The Zimbabwe money will not work in America in that moment. So it's to help you um, con conceptualize the spectrum of liquidity. Not all money is the same liquid. We call this often casually strength, right? The US dollar is very strong. Uh, or the yen is strengthening uh, compared to the dollar when the economy is growing. The strength of the money is actually the liquidity of the money. How much can it flow everywhere and use its superpower? Become what you want. So, a liquid currency is a valuable currency. If you make a currency after this lecture, but no one will accept your currency, it's not really money. It doesn't have the superpower. It's not liquid at all. If you make a currency, like some of the ones we talked about, Bitcoin, and over time, more and more people will accept it and say, okay, I'll take your Bitcoin, I'll give you the pizza, then your currency is valuable because it's liquid. So when we talk about user-generated currency, it's not exactly as simple as user-generated video. It's not as easy to make money as it is to make a video. But it's coming. It's coming. Why? Because the only thing needed for a video to be successful is an audience that's watching. YouTube got an audience. Hundreds of millions of people watch YouTube. What's needed for money to be successful is not just an audience. It's a network. It's a community of many to many that will accept the money, that will spend the money, that will use the money, that will honor the money. So it's one order of complexity more challenging. And because it's complex and challenging, today, these are the only liquid currencies that we have. Again, some are more liquid, some are less liquid, but most of the national money that's made by government is, is somewhat liquid. If not on the street, then at least in a change, <coughs> in a change kiosk or in a bank. They'll accept almost all of these monies and give you what you need, what you ask for. So today, in order to have a valuable currency, to any degree of value or liquidity, you need to be a country. Just like in the past, in order to have a newspaper, an official newspaper, you needed to be a country, right? Or a state, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the I don't know your local, your regional newspaper. Um, the News of Japan. The Nikkei. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was that hard once to be the creator of news. Today, with the internet, because of YouTube and WordPress, which is the blogosphere, because of the Facebook feed, and groups, almost anyone 
can create and contribute news, let's call it news information, into society. And that is the change that we see happening with currency as well. Today, this is our world, and you could add here Bitcoin. Pretty, it's pretty liquid now. You can add here maybe Ethereum. It's pretty liquid now. Maybe two or three more you can add. But in the future, we expect to see hundreds of millions more currencies that are truly liquid in society that have that superpower, which is that other people will accept them, that they will unlock for you what you need and want from other people in society. So this is, uh, so now I want to walk you through a few examples of currencies that we have experimented with um, and help us make the connection between the theory, the ideas, and the practice, what's happening on the ground. So this is a project uh, that we did in Israel. It's called Lev Market. Lev means heart in Hebrew. And the currency uh, experiment that we did was called hearts. The currency was called hearts. Not yen, not dollar, heart. And this currency was used uh, by a group of mothers, uh, young mothers, new mothers, um, and uh, about 20,000 people joined this experiment. And they received hearts on day one, a little bit. And they could earn more hearts, just like we earn more money, by having jobs within this community of mothers. Maybe babysitting, maybe um, tutoring for the children, maybe walk the dog. Whatever the mothers uh, needed was a job that you could do and earn more hearts. And what could you do with your hearts? What can you do with money? You could spend it to buy other things that you need. And so the mothers could earn hearts and spend hearts within the community of 20,000 people. And what we saw in one year, we ran the experiment for one year, was $24 million worth of transactions in hearts. So $24 million, 240 million yen, ish, 240 million yen worth of transactions. What were they buying? Everything. Birthday cake, clothes that the child too big, uh, toys that I'm done with, services, uh, hair, hair do, manicure, all the things. And what we realized in this year was that if you counted all the GDP, all the economy of the country, the, the GDP was 80 billion shekels worth uh, of commerce, but they didn't count these $24 million worth of commerce that happened in hearts, but they happened. We saw them happen in the network because it was a iPhone app. <laughs> because it was a mobile uh, application, we could see all the movements of the hearts. And so what we, under what we wondered, the question that we had and that we were asked all the time, is why did they not do this commerce before the hearts? All the mothers were already there. All the stuff, all these things were already there. All the needs of the people were already there. Why did they, why did they not collaborate? Why did they not transact before the hearts? They had shekels, they already had money, answer is they didn't have enough money. They didn't have enough shekels. They had some shekels, like yen or dollars, and they used them for rent for their house. They used them for gas for the car, for a doctor, for school. But as many people in our world, at the end of the day or the end of the month, they didn't have any extra 
for a cake or a class or a manicure or a uh, babysitter. They had only the bare minimum of money and no extra. When we gave them new money, parts, suddenly all this economic collaboration happened between the people. The reason that they weren't helping each other with a cake and a bike and a clothes and a toy before was they didn't have the tool. They didn't have the money. The money is the tool that lets the commerce flow between the people. It's true that in ancient times we could barter. I have a bike, you have a cake, I can switch with you, give you the bike, you give me the cake. But what are the chances that you want a bike and I want a cake? Small. And what are the chances that we all find exactly what we need, what we want, and the person that has what we want, they want exactly what we have? It's very small. That's why we invented money. That's the superpower of money that we don't have to match our wants and needs. You can sell me the cake, I give you money. And you can take the money and buy tomatoes from somebody else in the network. The money is the flow that connects all of our commerce. And these people did not have enough money to flow the commerce to their maximum potential of what they could be doing together, how they could be working together, how they could help each other. So we published our work, and uh, a very famous uh, researcher uh, discovered our work. His name is uh, Bernard Leotard. Um, Bernard was uh, one of the co-architects of the euro currency. He was a central banker from Belgium. And they asked him to help design the new euro in the 90s uh, when they wanted to reimagine the European economy. Bernard is uh, very well known for this book, Rethinking Money, because he describes uh, economic networks and economic communities like natural ecosystems in nature like uh, the biosphere, like the earth. The earth is also a complex system with air and water and trees and multiple animals and humans and uh, all the things working in a kind of system design. And economies are also complex systems with a system design. And so when he looked at nature and he asked, what are the most successful ecosystems in nature? What are the environments that are the most sustainable, that are the least fragile? They're the ones with multiple sources of energy, with multiple sources of food, with multiple animals, multiple plants, multiple water sources. Think of the forest. It's not just monkeys in the forest. It's hundreds and thousands of animals and plants and trees. It's not one kind of tree. It's many, many, many kinds of trees and they're all a little different. Some need more sun, some need less sun. They're all similar but different. And those ecosystems in nature that have the most diversity, the most kinds of the most things, they are the most resilient. They are the ones that survive because they can withstand all kinds of circumstances as they change. If there's a little less light, some trees might die, but the other trees that need less light, they will grow. If there's less water, some animals might not survive, but the other ones that need less water, they'll be okay. And so the system continues to flow and evolve and not die as a total because it has diversity of energy resources. And if we go back just one moment to this idea, 
What Bernard says is that economies which rely on one source of energy, one tool, one currency, are the most fragile and likely to die if anything happens to the currency. When the yen gets weak, Japan struggles. When uh, the dollar has a crisis, which happens a lot, America struggles. And it's not Japan, the idea of Japan struggles, or the uh, Prime Minister of Japan struggles, it's usually the people of Japan struggle. And same in America, and same everywhere. When the currency is in danger, when the currency is weak, the economy struggles, which means the people struggle. They struggle to get what they need, they struggle to be who they can be, they struggle to reach their potential. <coughs> So Bernard, um, Bernard looks at a concept called the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Has anyone heard of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals? Cool. I'll tell you briefly. Um, the UN, the United Nations, made a list of all the things that we need to do as, as the world in order to have basic well-being for everyone. So things like enough food for everyone, clean water for everyone, uh, no more poverty, uh, no more human trafficking, enough energy, Wi-Fi. What we need for the basics. And when they made this list and they did the calculations, how much will it cost to get the basics to everyone? Who can guess how much will it cost? The UN thinks. Four trillion dollars. Four trillion US dollars is the price of everyone in the world having the basics. And Bernard and many thinkers who, who ask themselves, how can we raise four trillion dollars? Which country, which government will contribute enough so that we have four trillion dollars? Most people who study politics and international relations they say it's never going to happen. We're never going to get $4 trillion of donations from the countries, economies, from the currencies that we have to get the basic needs for everyone. And so Bernard and others, other researchers, suggest if we need $4 trillion, let's make $4 trillion more dollars. If that's what's between us and having everything we need, let's make more of the tool. Let's make the tool more accessible. Let's give the tool to more people so that they can do more commerce, more collaboration, help each other, and get the basics. So I started with this concept, uh, the long tail. Uh, this is uh, a phenomenon that we know from the internet, which says that when you reduce the barriers to entry, when you make the technology so easy that many, many people can use it. So this is like YouTube, right? Who uses YouTube here? You guys watch it. And who uploads videos to YouTube? Yes. You already got a shirt, but now you got one. Um, so the, the long tail tells us that when you make it so easy, like as easy as YouTube, on you know, YouTube you click and you watch. To upload is a little more complicated, but not so much. You take a video and then you upload. So when you reduce the technical difficulty and you let everyone use the technology, you get a long tail. A long tail means these are the greatest hits. Okay, these are the biggest videos on YouTube, the top 10. These are the top 10 most read blogs. So this is like Justin Bieber, Beyonce, the top, top 10. And this long tail 
It's hundreds of millions long. It goes all the way, all the way, all the way. Maybe this is like a cat video. You know, you've seen these on YouTube, the cats playing. Maybe only a hundred people watch this video. Maybe only five people watch that video over there. But what they say and what we see from internet research is that this long tail, all this hundreds of millions of small and diverse uh, content together is orders of magnitude more than the hits. So the hundred million YouTube videos that we never watched, maybe someone will watch some of them. The hundred million videos together have more eyes, more clicks, more volume than the top ten. Than Justin Bieber plus Beyonce plus what do you guys, what do you guys like in the top ten? So the interesting thing about what I'm telling you is that the long tail is bigger and potentially more powerful, more connected than the greatest hits in any internet platform that we have seen yet. Look at Amazon. There are maybe top, the top 10 books on Amazon that everyone read, the Bible, you know, whatever are the top 10. But Amazon is a, is a many, many billions business, many, because of the long term. Because they sell every book, even the little book, that only two people bought that book. But all of these books combined is a hundred billion dollar business. So on this graph, what I showed you here is the long tail idea in the world of currency. So in this top 10, today we have the dollar, the euro, the yen, the Chinese currency, the um, Kenyan currency, the top 10, probably Kenya is not yet in the top 10. Um, and then we have the top cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ether, these are the, these are the, the hits, the greatest hits so far of the currency world. But in this long tail, with the hundreds of millions of user-generated currencies, currencies that you can make, and I can make, and anyone can make, we can potentially have more volume, more value, more usage than the top currencies of the world, than the dollar euro and the yen. This is people-powered money. This has never been seen before in society. Um, again, I'll show you just a quick example uh, that we are running these experiments, these currency experiments, uh, all over the world. Um, and we plan also soon to start running them here in Japan. Um, this is a picture from our uh, community in Kenya, uh, outside of Nairobi. It is a community with almost no access to money, almost no money at all. Um, and they created their own currency uh, called Serafu, which is a Swahili word uh, for freedom. And uh, they issue these currencies uh, to the moms in the community. And the moms use the money to talk with each other. Because all the people are there in this town. And all the, the food, they grow it themselves. They have earth and sun and seeds. And now that they have this money, they're able to trade more freely between them and also more freely with other communities nearby. People ask me sometimes, if anyone can make money, why has this not happened yet? It's so obvious. I can make money. Great. I make money. Why, why not? And the reason why not is what we talked about at first, liquidity. 
money is only valuable, it can only really be money when other people will accept it. So currency is like, um, go back to this, like hearts. They worked good inside the community, 20,000 moms. But outside the community, no one accepts hearts. They don't know what, they've never heard of hearts. And even when they hear of it, they don't like hearts. They don't want hearts, they want yen, shekels, dollars. And so the reason that we have not yet seen anyone and everyone create their own money is because we haven't had the technology yet that lets all of this new money, all of this user-generated money, be compatible, be exchangeable, be interoperable, even outside of your community. Because if you have to convince everyone in the world that they should accept hearts, it's never going to work. And if you have to convince everyone in the world that they should accept a Sarafu currency, it's never going to work. And so this is where Bancor began its journey in cryptocurrency and developing the Bancor protocol in order to build the technology that would let any heart be exchanged for any Sarafu currency, for any currency that you would create or I would create, without having to manually convince everybody to accept your currency. Okay until now? Awake? Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. So, so how did we do it? We uh, invented a method, you can call it a language, a language for money to talk to each other, a protocol for currencies to exchange back and forth and know by the language how much this is worth, how much parts should I get for a serfu? How much serifu should I get for a uh, for a star currency? How? What are the prices of these currencies? Who decides? If people have to decide, it's going to be a mess, like we see in politics. But if computers can decide, then maybe we can build a network that is fair, that's predictable, that's transparent and allow the currencies to flow between the people. If we can do that, then anyone can create a currency and connect it to this network. Anyone's currency, if it speaks this language, can be interchangeable for anyone else's currency at some price. So this is how we trade currency today. It's also how we trade stocks in the stock market today. I have A and I want B. You have B and you want A, so we switch. We use money for barter so that we don't have to do this. But when we trade money, a yen for a dollar or a shilling for a shekel, we don't have money for money. When you trade money, you trade it like this, you barter like this, you match wants and needs. These are the forex markets, the foreign exchange markets. They get orders for dollars and orders for yen and they swap. And if more people want dollars than yen, then the price of the dollar goes up. If more people want yen than dollars, then the price of the yen goes up. This is today how we trade currency. Of course, there are problems here. It says it on the slide. What's the risk of liquidity? That I want B, I want the square, but there's no one else who has a square they want to sell. If no one else wants to trade with me, I have a liquidity problem. I can't use my money. It has no power. 
there can be fraud in the system. So buyer and seller can be the same person pretending to buy and sell and buy and sell and manipulate the market into thinking that a lot of activity is happening. Even though it's a game I'm playing with myself in order to fool other people. That these currencies are very interesting. You want to buy this. Look at how many people are buying it. But really, it's just me. That's, that's a, a kind of game we call fraud. Manipulation. Uh, and of course, there's friction. You need someone to help match the people who want A and the people who have B and match them. This is what we call exchanges. The stock market is an exchange. Cryptocurrency exchanges offer the service for the trading of cryptocurrencies. Um, and it's a very uh, imperfect system. It looks a lot like this. Do you recognize these guys? Uh, have you seen the movie The Wolf of Wall Street? Leonardo DiCaprio. So in the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, it really shows us what trading, financial trading, actually looks like. Okay, it doesn't look very good. It looks like a lot of uh, games, like a casino, where people are trying to win the game. And of course, this is in the 80s or 90s, you can tell by the computer. Like my father worked on those computers. And in the modern times, this looks like algo trading. Five screens, this graphs. Super, super fast and smart and calculated trading of assets and stocks and cryptocurrencies all over the world to find the pockets where you can scrape the profit. That's what financial trading uh, looks like. And it's okay, but it's not great. We think it could be better. And so uh, in cryptocurrency, this idea was developed, peer-to-peer, -peer, trading between people directly. If you have heard of or maybe read the Bitcoin white paper, Bitcoin shared with the world a method, a technological method, a mathematical method, to allow value, money, Bitcoin specifically, to move from peer to peer. How can we have a system where the money never starts in the middle, there's no bank, there's no government, there's no Wall Street, there's no trader, but all the people can trust that the money is moving where it should go. That if you paid me for something, I have the money. You don't have the money anymore. Only I have. Peer-to-peer -peer is what we see in the internet with comments on the YouTube video. That's us talking peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, and in, in currency, peer-to-peer -peer is allowing people to match each other. What Bancor suggests is actually peer-to-machine, <coughs> matching everybody to a computer to a smart contract, as we call it in blockchain, to a mathematical, you can think of it like a, an automated bank or a robotic bank. Every buyer can buy from the computer. Every seller can sell to the computer. The computer will always be the buyer and be the seller on every transaction. What you get from that is no liquidity risk, the computer always works. It's always the computer is always there. And it's fair because it doesn't know you and it doesn't know me. And it doesn't give me a better price because I'm very wealthy. And it doesn't give you a worse price because it doesn't know who you are. It's a computer. It's a robot. It tells you like a vending machine what is the price. That's the price. We don't negotiate the price. We don't buy and sell from my own self in order to raise the price. There is a price. I can take it or leave it. 
and it's frictionless. I send the money to the robot bank, to the smart contract, and it sends me back the money that I want at the price of the, that the mathematical formula calculates. I will go through this slide pretty fast because it's one layer more into the math, how the math works in this uh, computer bank, this robotic bank. If you want to learn more about this, please talk to me uh, after. Please contact me and, and contact our community. We can talk about this for hours. Today we'll talk about it for one minute. So the way the computer bank works and the way that it uses the math is a simple story, a simple formula. It has two buckets, A and B, and the computer is programmed to think that bucket A is always the same value as bucket B. Same value, same value. And the computer can accept A and give back B. You can accept B and give back A. That's what this robot knows how to do, nothing else. How does the robot know, or the, the protocol, know how much B to give for the A that it got? Or how much A to give for the B that it got? Well, it always thinks that the two buckets are equal. So we start with 10 and 10. If someone <coughs> wants to buy B, and give A, they send in A, and the computer gives back B. Because they're equal, and we have 10 and 10, one A equals one B, right? Simple. So I got one A, and I gave one B. But now, in the buckets, in the, in the computer bank, I only have nine B, because I gave one, and I have 11A, because I got one. But I still think the buckets are equal. So now, 9B equals 11A. So the new price of 1B is not 1A. That would be 9 and 9, or 11 and 11. The new price of 1B is 1.2 It's 11 divided by 9. It's not rocket science. It's basic math. But the mechanism is so powerful because it constantly adjusts the price of this compared to this based on how much people are selling of this and how much people are buying of this. So this mechanism works because it can't be changed. It can't be changed. It will always do this. And this, it, you know, it's a very brief explanation, but this is the, the heart of the Bancorp protocol, which is if we can connect currencies like this, and you can have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you can have hundreds of millions of currencies. And the way that you connect them into a network, the language that you use, is this formula. This is the language. This is the story of this currency network. Is that because everyone has one bucket of B, and it's not just B, it's BNT. <laughs> BNT is the Bancord Network Token. That's our currency that powers this system. Because every currency has one bucket of BNT and one bucket of their own currency, whether it's A or C, B, D, E, F, currency you made, currency I made, currency someone else made, there's always a price between B and T and A and between B and T and B and B and T and C and B and T and D. So there's also always a price between A and B and C and D and E and F and everything else. 
It's a network with a hub that allows every currency in the network to always have an automatic price, to always be exchangeable for any other currency in the network. Every currency in this network that speaks this language, that uses this protocol, has that superpower of being exchangeable for any other currency in the network. And you might want any currency at any time, either because you just want it, maybe because you want to invest in it, maybe because you want to uninvest in it, sell it, maybe because you're shopping in the community of mothers, and they only accept hearts, so you need hearts. Maybe because you're visiting in Kenya, and they accept Sarah food, so you want Sarah food. And many other examples that we can use in this world of user-generated currencies that are diverse and nearly infinite. So this is uh, the, the key methodology behind the Bancor protocol. It makes the currency network look more like this and less like isolated islands of liquidity connected by manual trading, which is now, of course, digital trading that we know on Wall Street and other places. So just a few quick facts about where Bancor is today, and again, if you want to learn more about this, we can talk about it at length. I'll say it briefly. Today in the Bancor network, there are 120 <coughs> currencies. Actually now 140 currencies since I made this slide. But more and more currencies, cryptocurrencies, are joining the network, are integrating this protocol so that their currency can be exchangeable for any of the 140 currencies in the network and as it grows. Because any to any network architecture, the amount of pairs, trading pairs, that are possible is exponential, right? 7,750 pairs can be made out of 120 tokens. In regular financial markets, you need one pair per currency. Dollars and yen is its own pair. Dollars and euro is its own pair. Dollars and shekels is its own pair. And for now shekels and yen to trade, you need shekels and yen as a pair. In a network architecture, because you always have the same language, the same protocol, the same math, any currency can be traded for any currency at any time, which lends to thousands of pairs and an exponential pair graph. You can see it here. And until now, we've been alive in the market for one year. These 120 tokens have generated a billion and a half dollars worth of exchanges between them. A billion and a half USD of Token A for token B, token C for token D, token G for token I have happened through the network uh, in one year. And this slide, Bancor X, is really the future uh, that we see, which is building bridges between the different currency ecosystems. <laughs> whether those currency networks are on Ethereum, which is a platform, you can think of it like uh, uh, Windows, whether those currency networks are on EOS, you can think of it like uh, Apple, whether those currency networks are in uh, fiat, in uh, national money, you can think of it like uh, Android, the, the future that we envision is that every currency to every currency in the world will be automatically tradable for every other one in a way that's fair, that's open, 
that's efficient, that's predictable, transparent, mathematical, um, all the things that we think uh, are useful for this network. I'll leave this. Um, there's a few ways that you can get involved with Bancor, and really if anyone wants to, to talk about them, you can talk to me and also to Taiki and to Rio, right here. Um, who uh, manage our community here in Japan, but I'm happy to be in touch with anyone, anytime, about anything, truly. And uh, I'll leave it on this slide, which is, uh, this is the Bancor logo, and uh, our community here in Japan designed what I think is an amazing Japanese logo uh, for uh, the Bancor network, and they use it here um, with their community. Um, and of course, the, the idea of Bancor moving forward is that we can have hundreds of thousands of communities like this which use currency to work together, give services, <coughs> buy products, help each other do this thing that we call living in many, many, many different ways and yet all connected. So that's, uh, that's what I have to share with you today. Thank you so much for listening because I know it's a lot. Um, and I look forward uh, to your questions and to our t-shirts. <laughs>